How's it going? Um, so I promised you some breakdown tutorials for the Adobe Suite and uh, here I am, Friday afternoon, <laughs> regretting that I made that promise in the first place. Now, okay, cool. So we're going to take a look at Photoshop, Illustrator and InDesign. For those of you on the film side, I'm just going to be focusing on those as they're more in depth and I think that you'll learn more from these anyway. All right, so starting with Photoshop, as I'm sure those of you who have me know, I'm not the biggest fan, um, but that's just personal preference, the way that I work with Illustrator for my animations. Um, but anyway, so Photoshop itself is um, geared towards any sort of photo manipulation or retouching, as well as digital painting. Um, it is one of the sort of most, let's say, broad um, pieces of software that the Adobe Suite has to offer. Um, you can pretty much find any way to do anything that you might need to do in Photoshop. Um, so it's a fantastic generalist tool as well as then obviously specializing in things such as photo bashing, photo touch-ups, um, content creation, digital painting, etc. All right. So let's take a look. So first off, we have got our home page when we open up the software. All right. You'll see that we've got tutorials to begin with. We've also got all of our most recent files that we can dive into and we can create a new document. All right. So I'm going to stick with HDTV 1080p. We'll bring my resolution up to 300. All right. You'll see that we've got pixels per inch and pixels per centimeters. So we'll just stick with that PPI pixels per inch. Um, and we're working with pixels when we deal with um, content dedicated for screen. Okay, we then have our color mode. We can either go for grayscale, RGB, CMYK. Grayscale just means that everything we create will be in shades of black and white. RGB being the color spectrum that we use for on-screen creation and CMYK being the color setting that we use for print. All right, RGB standing for red, green, blue. CMYK standing for cyan, magenta, yellow, and key. Key being black. All right, my background contents, I can set to white, black, or transparent. Transparent is a fairly decent option to go for, especially when we start looking at masks, but for now we can leave that as white. Okay, and we can then say create. All right, so let's make sure that we're all looking at the same thing. I'm gonna to go to workspace, and I'm going to set it to graphic and web. All right, so we should all be taking a look at this now. Great stuff, okay. Um, so let's go through the, uh, the tool panel. We'll take a look at the control panel and we will work at it from there. All right, so our tool panel is here on the left. We've got our move tool, our artboard tool, marquee selection tools, uh, crop, eye drop, brush, eraser, gradient, type, pen. We've got our path selection and we have our shapes. All right, and at the bottom we've got our color panel. Cool, so we'll dive into those in a moment. Um, just to give us an idea of how Photoshop works in terms of dealing with its content, um, Photoshop works with individual layers for every asset that we bring in. So everything that we bring into Photoshop will sit on top of its own layer. This differs quite greatly from Illustrator and InDesign. Um, it's one of the only softwares that really does this apart from like Premiere, um, as far as I know. All right, so when we dive in, our very first layer is background. We can see that that's locked. I can unlock it simply by clicking on the little lock icon. And as soon as I do, it gets relabeled to layer one. So I can relabel my layers by double clicking on the name. I'll just call this BG for background and hit enter. Okay, cool. So to go about adding or creating layers, we have our little plus icon down here at the bottom of our layer panel. All right, so that creates our new layers and layer one and as many as I create onwards. All right, um, I can then delete assets that or layers that I don't need. And if these layers have content, they'll give me a content warning, which we can then just say yes or no, delete that file or not. All right, cool. We also then have a little folder icon down here. All right, so if I click on that, it creates a group. Now, grouping is a great way for us to keep our layer panel nice and neat. We need to make sure that it's easily um, sort of navigated, not only for our sake, but also should we need to pass this file along to someone else, submit it for marking, whatever. Um, having a neat layer panel is definitely going to place you in good stead with not only your lecturers, but also potential employers. All right, so I'm just gonna call this example and you'll see that I can either drag and drop a layer into that folder, 
All right, so you can see it's now dropped down inside, or I can drag above and um, sort of indicate where this layer is going to be by these blue lines. All right, so I'll just drag this inside, not double click, drag it inside of example. All right, when I have the folder itself selected, any layers that I make will automatically be placed inside of that. Okay, cool. So let's take a look at a few of our tools. All right, so let's grab our shape tool to begin with. Um, and when we grab our shape tool, we need to make sure that we either adjust the setting from path to shape. All right, so if we actually want to draw a square, we need to make sure this is set to shape. If we want to make selections, we would then use a path, which we'll get to. All right, so once I have this selected, you'll see that I have a few options up here in my control panel. And I've got some options down here at the bottom of my tool panel. All right, so let's take a look at here. So we've got our fill. Clicking on fill brings up um, some swatches for us. And we can take a look at gradient from there. And we can also grab our color picker with our option over here. All right, let me cancel that for now. We also then have a stroke option. So we can turn on whether or not our uh, shape will have a stroke and we can then adjust the thickness of that stroke, that line. All right. So I also then have some options down here at the bottom. Okay. First of all, you'll notice that we've got a color sitting on top of another one. This means that this one is currently selected and I can swap them back and forth by clicking this little arrow or hitting X on my keyboard, X for X-ray. Okay. And you'll see as that swaps around, we have got those affecting at the top here. All right. So I can double click these sections and they will bring up my color picker tool. All right. Very, very cool. And um, you'll notice that every color as I sort of move around has got this little hex code. All right. So it's got its hue and saturation values, RGB and CMYK values. But this hex code refers to the exact color of the pixel that I'm currently sitting on top of. All right, Adobe software being able to generate literally millions of colors. So this is how we go about making sure we have the exact shade, hue, or color that we need. Okay, so we'll just say OK to that. And I will then adjust my background color to be something else. Let's try and make it a bit more complementary. There we go. Cool, so now when I draw my shape, there we go. All right, so you can see that my stroke has been affected here. I can click on that and grab my color picker as well just to make any changes that I want. And I can say OK to that. All right. When we create our shape, we also then open up our property panel. OK, so this is where I can either type in exact coordinates or height uh, and width values. I can adjust the thickness of my stroke here as well which will live update for me. I can adjust whether my stroke is solid or if it is dotted and pixelated or dashed, obviously because I've got quite a small size uh, of a square. Let me bring this down for you and see if we can get a better example. There we go. All right, so we can kind of just place these there as well if necessary. We can then adjust how we want our uh, caps to be dealt with. Right, so a sort of butt cap like this just means that wherever our point is, let me grab my pen tool for a moment so I can show this to you. Okay, we'll do that and um, uh, okay, never mind. <laughs> Sorry, I'm losing focus. Friday, Friday, like brain fart. Okay, so butt cap just means that our line is not going to extend beyond the point of our vertices, which are these points over here. All right, so if it was a straight line, it would not extend beyond those points. Um, we can then adjust it so that it rounds off on the edges, extending beyond the point, or it is squared off beyond the edge. All right, we also then can set where our lines or how our lines are going to be interpreted. So squared, rounded, or um, sort of beveled, right? Um, and then we also have access to our Pathfinder, which we'll take a look at a little bit later down the line. Okay, so that is my first shape creation. Okay, you'll see there that it has created a label for me, rectangle one, and it is currently a shape layer. So if I hit Command or Control T, Tree tra uh, free transform, I can then 
scale this up as necessary or um, down as necessary right using my selection tool so I've got a path selection tool and a direct selection tool okay so let's cover these quickly before I get sort of lost um, so your direct selection tool allows you to interact with vertices as they are so this becomes a live shape all right which means that I can constantly update it if I am working with my path selection tool I'm working with the shape as a whole all right, so that's kind of how I would interact with it, um, move it around, and uh, sort of just place assets as necessary. All right, I can then also rasterize this layer by right-clicking on it. I'll get into the difference between rasterizing and smart objects in a moment, but this would flatten that image and allow me to paint on top of it. Okay, I'm going to get rid of that for now. All right. We then obviously also have our rounded rectangle tool, our ellipse tool, etc. Okay, and you can see that our stroke width is getting nice and large there. And again, sorry, one last option here for the stroke. We can determine or say that the stroke should be inside of my lines, extend beyond my lines, or extend on the outside of my lines. So let's give you a better idea. So that's extending on the outside. That's extending equidistant around my path and this is extending on the inside. Okay, cool. All right, so that is essentially the shape layers as we would go about creating shapes. All right, we also then have our pen tool, shortcut for that is P, and we can click and drag. All right, so again, we can make a path, which is what we use for our selections, and we can also create a shape. Okay, so, the pen tool works in a sort of couple of ways. We can either create polygonal points where we kind of just click and create these jagged edges. And in order to close a shape, we need to click on our point of origin, right? the very first point that we made. Alternatively, I can click and drag, which makes a beziered path for me. And that allows me to adjust these handles, which I will have access to with my direct selection tool. All right, so there I can adjust these handles as necessary. Okay, cool. I also then have access to my Convert Vertex tool, as well as my Freeform Pen and a Curvature Pen tool, which is essentially applying that Bezier. I can add further anchor points, all right, with this little plus icon and adjust them as necessary. And I can also delete anchor points if necessary. But if I have my direct selection tool selected, I can delete a point that I have chosen. Okay. I also then have my convert point tool. Um, in most other softwares, as far as I know, it's called the convert vertex tool. And this allows me to change a point into a beziered point, or I can remove the handles. All right, so this becomes very, very useful when we want to start creating complex shapes. Complex shapes just meaning that they're not your typical rectangle, circle, etc. All right, so that is that for our pen tool and our shape tool. All right, so when it comes, and I apologize now, I'm kind of jumping all over the place, um, but it is very difficult to explain any of the Adobe software in sort of separated pieces because everything kind of just feeds off of everything else. Um, so to go about navigating our workspace, we can hit Z for Zebra, for zoom, we can zoom in and out. I can either then hold down Option or Alt, click to zoom out, or I have access to my little buttons up here at the top, which determines um, zooming in or out. And you can use your trackpad to zoom in and out. On the MacBooks, it's kind of just like pinching and dragging. And then um, for Windows machines, I think you can use your mouse wheel to scroll in and out. All right, and then V for my selection tool, um, just to jump back to that. Okay, I can also hold down spacebar and that will activate my hand tool. So if I zoom in, I can then move around my artboard as I see fit. And Photoshop actually supplies like a drag feature. So if I click and drag, it kind of throws my canvas around, uh, which is quite cool. All right, alternatively, I can hit the H on my keyboard, H for hotel, and I can use that to drag as well. All right, but seeing as when we hold down spacebar, it activates the hand tool, and then when I release, it goes back to the tool I have selected. That's a, a much nicer work tool. All right. Okay, what is next? We have then got 
the selection tools. All right, so let's talk about importing files into Photoshop. There are two main methods when it comes to importing files. We can place embedded files and we can place linked files. All right, so placing an embedded file is essentially me, uh, okay, I'm just going to do a selfless plug quickly and just throw this one in. All right, so I can place an object that is embedded into my file. And what this essentially means is I've taken all of its information and pasted it inside of Photoshop. So this will then lead to an increase in file size. So if I'm placing hundreds of embedded files, this file slowly becomes larger and larger and becomes more difficult to sort of manage. However, it is necessary if we are working across multiple machines because at least then in our file we have everything that we need and regardless of what we open uh, or whatever machine we open this file on, let me say, um, all of our information will be there. All right. An alternative is to place a linked file. All right. Uh, do I have an interesting thing for that? Not really. Um, let's just go with something like... I'll find it eventually. Uh, yeah, I really am bad at this. Okay, let's just go with this one. All right, so I can bring in pretty much any type of file I want. And when I, let's see if PDF will read. Yeah, so when I bring in a linked file, what I'm doing is I'm saying to, um, I'm saying to Photoshop that this file exists somewhere in a folder on my machine and um, it creates a path that links that information to Photoshop. So if I were to move this file out of its original folder or if I were to save this Photoshop file and take it onto a different machine that does not have this asset, it's not going to be there. All right, so we use linked file placement when we're working on our own machines, and that allows us to keep our file sizes to the bare minimum, which prevents software crashing, and it allows for faster saves. Okay, cool. So when I bring in an object, I need to hit enter in order to place that selection. And you'll see that I have some icons here. All right, so this little link icon here shows that this is a linked file. This little icon here shows that this is a smart object. All right, so we have two different file types. We have a smart object and a rasterized object. Okay, and Photoshop deals almost exclusively with rasterized content and uh, Illustrator then works with its vector content. All right, so to give you a quick idea, I'm just going to duplicate this. I can either right click on my layer and I can select duplicate or I can hit Control or Command J and it will duplicate for me. Okay, so if I right click and select rasterize on this image, you'll see that that little thumbnail disappears. Okay, and what that means is I have told Photoshop all the information is correct, keep it as it is. Um, we're not going to be adjusting the scale at this point. All right, so if I were to adjust the scale of my smart object, Command or Control T for free transform, I can scale it all the way down hit enter and I can then scale it back up again without having lost any information. However, with my rasterized layer, again, control or command T, we are going to scale that all the way down, hit enter, bring it back up again, and you'll see that we are pixelating horribly. All right, that's because when I scaled this down, I told Photoshop, cool, it only needs to be this big, get rid of all the excess information that is not visually sort of uh, representative. Okay, so those are the big differences. So we'll bring objects or images in as smart objects, and then we will work with a duplicate of that to make sure that we don't ruin anything. Okay, so a good work method is to duplicate any sort of smart object that you bring in, create a folder and just collect your original assets. So I'll just call these OG assets, which I can then lock and turn off as necessary. I can then rasterize my layers and this allows me to paint on top of them or to erase them or anything like that. Whereas were I to try and do that on my smart object, it would tell me that it has to be rasterized first before I can interact with it. 
Okay, cool. So moving along, let us talk about masks. All right, let's see, tools, workspace, canvas, and artboards. Okay, so before we move on to masks, Photoshop, we work on canvases. We also have access to artboards. Um, so I can create multiple artboards, which I can then move around and uh, scale as necessary. All right, and the major benefit of working with multiple artboards is that if I needed a very specific layout and I wanted to see all my work next to each other, I could create and duplicate those artboards, create everything within one document, export those artboards separately, and I don't have to dive back and forth between multiple files. Okay, cool. So now let's talk about masks. So one of the greatest things about Photoshop and something that I do really enjoy is the uh, deep etching process. All right, so let me introduce you to the two different types of masks. First one being the rasterized mask. Okay, so we can apply a raster mask onto any of our layers simply by clicking on this little icon at the bottom of our layers panel. So that kind of looks like a Japanese flag. And if I click on that, you'll see that it has now created a white um, thumbnail over here and then a link showing that it will affect what it is linked to. All right. And what this allows me to do is to paint information in and out in a non-destructive way. So if I were to erase something on my artwork, right, I'm deleting that information and there's no way for me to get it back. So if I mess up and uh, I need to sort of go back a good couple of steps, it's essentially a ruined time, all right, which is why we create duplicates of our original pieces just in case. All right. However, on these masks, using our brush tool and uh, in conjunction with our eraser tool, we can paint information in and out of existence. Okay. So currently my brush is set to white. And if I use black, I can paint out information. All right. And as I paint, you'll see that I'm actually applying some black information to my thumbnail. It's giving me an idea of what is visible and what is not. All right, hitting X to swap back to my white information, I can then paint that back in. All right, so it's a completely non-destructive method of removing information. We're not losing any information. It is all retained. Okay, so the sort of biggest thing about raster and vector masks, as I'm sure you guys remember from your theory, is that um, it's how they go about interpreting information. Okay, so to begin with, raster masks kind of deal with it in a very black or white manner. As we've seen, if it is covered in white, it is visible. If we paint it out in black, it is not visible. All right. One of the major benefits to this, though, is when we want to deep etch, as I've said. So deep etching is essentially the process of softening the edges of our assets so that they don't look so stark. So if you can imagine that I have sort of photoshopped a person into a different background, if we still have that sharp edge showing a little bit of information from where they came from, it looks like a very sort of stark, unbelievable sort of interaction. So we go in, we soften up the edges. Our eyes naturally soften edges as they sort of interpret light falling off of objects. So we sell that idea a little bit better. Okay. So this is where I would sort of go in. Um, I would have made my selection and put this onto its own layer, which is the step that I'll show you next. But essentially, I would zoom in nice and close, grab my brush tool, and I would paint that information out, obviously making sure that I'm working correctly. OK, so I could paint out all this information and then soften my brush and go through. Before I get into the brush and eraser, I first want to give you a tour of the selection tools. All right, so the first selection tool that we have is either our rectangular or elliptical marquee tool. And I need to make sure that I'm working on the correct layer at any given time, all right? I can then make my selection like so. I get these little marching ants, giving me an idea of the, the sort of border of my selection, and I can move that around as necessary, okay? Um, I can then add or subtract from my selection. So I either have some options up here at the top. This first one adds on top. So whatever I draw, it will add. This one subtracts. All right. And then this one intersects. Cool. However, 
some shortcuts if I am making my selection. I can always hold down Shift, which is my additive modifier, and Option or Alt, which is my subtractive modifier. So you see I'm holding down Option now, you get a little minus key, and holding Shift, I get a little plus key. All right, in order to actually interact with this selection, like I said, we have to be on the correct layer. If I were to right click here, you'll see I have a couple of options. I can deselect, I can select the inverse, which means it'll select everything outside of my selection. I can feather that selection, I can mask it, which we'll get to, and I can layer by copy and cut, which I'll show as well. All right, if I wanted to do anything like that on top of my thumbnail, for example, uh, let me just grab that back there again and say layer by copy, maybe the wrong example. Just delete this quickly. If I have an empty layer, all right, you'll see that when I make my selection, it still looks as though it's sitting on top of everything, but I'm interacting with it on this layer. So if I try to do anything, it's going to give me a warning saying that there's no information. So I need to make sure that I'm on my actual piece of information correctly. All right, Command or Control D to get rid of the selection, otherwise right click and deselect. All right, then we have our lasso tool. This allows us to use a free form selection method. Very, very useful if we need to zoom in and make sure to add areas to our selection. So again, holding down Shift is my additive modifier, Option or Alt is my negative, and this gives me a lot more freedom when it comes to making my selections. Obviously, with this particular tool, a tablet is a lot better than a trackpad, a mouse being a lot better than a trackpad as well. Um, but yeah, so essentially that's there to help me with that. I then have my quick selection tools, which are absolutely fantastic, and they will become your best friends. Um, so my quick select tool, I can increase the size of this by hitting my square bracket keys on my keyboard. This is for both Windows and Mac. So they can typically be found diagonally left above your return or enter key. All right, so close square bracket will make your brushes or selections larger. Close square bracket will make them smaller. Okay, so I can click and drag over the areas that I would like to be selected. And you'll see that it's automatically creating those marching ants for me. All right, so I could do a very quick selection like so, and then using my lasso tool, holding down shift to make sure that I added to my selection, I could then go and add or deselect areas as necessary. All right, cool. Then underneath that, we also have a magic wand tool, and that sort of just works on um, color values as opposed to selecting everything at once. Okay. We also have access to a polygonal lasso tool, which is sort of like the pen tool. We sort of click and then just create our points. Um, very similar, just a separate method of doing the same thing. Okay. So once I have my selection, we actually have a couple of options now. All right, you'll see that I've accidentally selected this, holding down option. I can click and remove. All right, so your selections, before I forget, um, <laughs> you're gonna hear that a lot. Your selections are based off of your color tone changes. All right. So the larger your selection tool is, this massive tool here, the sort of less refined its ability to select different color information is. All right. So you see I've clicked over here over this blue, but it's collected this entire zone. Whereas if I bring that down, it is slightly more refined in terms of reading that difference in hue and saturation. Okay, so just to give you a, an idea of that. Okay, cool. So now with any of my selection tools selected, making sure I'm on the right layer, I can right click. And what I'm going to select first is layer via copy. All right, so layer via copy copies the information uh, that we've just made, and it then places it on its own layer. Okay, we can also then grab another selection quickly. Uh, we can layer via cut. All right, so this is a more destructive method. It physically cut, cuts that information out of my original piece and places it on its own layer. All right, so again, depending on the, the outcome that you're looking for, using a destructive method can be okay, but typically we kind of want to, to avoid that. All right, so just holding down uh, Command and Z. That is our shortcut for 
a undo. All right, and then Command Shift Z is a sort of step forward, so you can sort of jump back and forth between your your actions and see how everything's working. All right. Um, what I can then also do is again with my selection tool, I can right click it and I can say select and mask. All right. So when I do that, you'll see it brings up my mask options. Okay, and I need to either um, adjust this and say OK, or I need to cancel it before I can continue interacting with my piece. So I can adjust the transparency to either remove or show my background. Um, the edge detection is what we use to sort of expand the edges of our selection. Uh, we can smooth that selection out. We can feather it, which softens the edges for us. We can adjust the contrast of that selection and we can move the edge of that selection in or out. All right, and then once we've done that, we can say OK, and it will have done that for us. OK, cool. Another way that we can go about creating some selections or masks, rather, is if we want to um, sort of create a vector mask. Now, vector mask is where we use either our shape tools or our pen tool to create a path rather than a shape. Okay, so what I'm going to do is for a vector mask, I'm going to go to layer and I can either create a layer mask or a vector mask. All right, saying reveal all will show everything, there's no difference, creates a thumbnail here for us. However, if we grab our shape tool and we set it to path, we click and drag, uh, <laughs> making sure I'm working on the correct thumbnail there. Um, it will then, if I hide my background, mask out areas all right if i were to make a let's go layer vector mask hide all this would then allow me to select and reveal no still hiding away don't do me like this uh just undo that i'll try and remember to speed these areas up but if you're stuck just feel free to like click ahead um, hide all and we'll just make sure that we are doing combined shapes additive there we go all right so that's how we can go about doing that and then we can use our direct selection tool shortcut for that is a to adjust these as necessary we've got access to our handles as well um, and we can use that obviously then to adjust our selection and you can see because we can edit it to this point that is why we refer to this as a vector mask as opposed to the rasterized version all right so that is that for masks let's take a look at guides all right so i'm going to delete that layer for now okay so pretty much all of our uh, adobe software have access to guides which help make life a lot easier for us. All right. So if I hit Command or Control R, you'll see it will bring up my rulers. I can also hide them for me as well. Uh, otherwise, I can go to View and I can turn on my rulers. All right. I also then have a Show option here, which is Show my guides, uh, Show my canvas guides and um, I can sort of hide these by holding down command or control and hitting my semicolon button. And I can also drag and place my guides by simply hovering over the rulers and clicking and dragging to place that. All right, so when we turn on the canvas guides, just to give you a quick idea, these are kind of action safe guides that have been preset for whatever kind of workspace you're working on. This being film, it gives us a good idea what information is safe and what will be on screen versus information that won't. Essentially like a bleed and gutter effect. You'll see that these can be interacted with. If you want to make sure that you don't accidentally mess around with your guides, we can then go to view and we can lock our guides. All right, we can clear them to delete them and we can also set the snap to option which means that my assets will snap towards these corners. Okay, um, I've introduced layers, all right? Um, so again, we need to make sure that we're always working on the correct layer. It's an absolutely heartbreaking moment to be working on um, 
what you think is the correct layer only to find out it was the incorrect layer and you've just painted over things and destructively ruined it and you have to go back by two hours. So very important that we get into the habit of making sure that we're working on the correct layers at any given time. Um, all right, so I've also introduced scaling. We bring in our asset and we can hit Control or Command T to free transform that and we need to hit Enter to then um, finalize that selection. All right, um, then we have our duplication um, options for this. All right, so there are a few ways that I can go about duplicating assets inside of Photoshop. Um, the first one is, like I said, right click and we can duplicate that layer. We can also hit Command or Control J to do that. And if I hold down Option or Alt, while hovering over a file, again with the correct layer selected, you'll see that I get a double arrowhead, one black, one white. All right, and if I click and drag, that makes a perfect duplicate for me. All right, so a great way if we're working with multiple shapes to uh, not have to continuously just go and draw out, draw out, draw out. All right, as designers, we should be naturally lazy, make use of the shortcuts while we can. Okay. Cool. So I mentioned then grouping objects. All right, so let me just dive that there and um, we'll just apply like a basic change to it. Let's just make it smaller. Okay. Um, so if I group objects, they then be, well, they are then treated as a single object together. All right. So if I were to just bring up my, where are my align options? Sorry, I really am all over the place today. Um, properties, maybe, no. Okay, anyway, uh, so if I wanted these objects to not be treated the same way, I don't want to interact with them as separate files, I can select them either by clicking and dragging in my workspace or by selecting my layers and hitting Command or Control G and that will then drop it inside of a group for us. Okay, which is quite nice. So automatically it then just collects everything for us. Okay, uh, works slightly differently than it does in Illustrator. Um, so I'll show you that method, but that is just how we go about grouping here in Photoshop. Um, I've done masks, quick selects, the marquees are part of the quick select. Um, all right, so painting. Let me introduce the brush tool to you guys. Okay, so I'll create a new layer quickly and I'll grab my brush tool, shortcut is B. All right, so when I have my brush tool selected, I have a couple of options. Again, making this larger with my closed square bracket. So it's gonna paint whatever color I have selected and it's going to paint whatever color is sitting on top. Okay, so if I wanted to have this nice plum color and then jump over to purple, I would just hit X to swap back and forth. Okay, uh, undoing all that garish bullshit. We also then have a couple of options up here at the top. Okay, so the first little drop down here gives us an idea of what our brush looks like. We've got our size and we've got a hardness value. Okay, hardness refers to how sharp or harsh the edge of our brush is. So if I bring that all the way down to zero, you'll see that we get more of like a spray paint smoky effect. Okay, this is the exact same for the eraser tool. E for eraser drop down works the exact same way. All right, you'll see that it's in brush mode. We'll leave it as is, and we then have the opacity option for both the uh, brush and the eraser tool. All right. Um, just to address this, this um, sort of color mode here, we'll take a look at these at a later stage. Um, I think they're beyond the sort of necessity of this tutorial, but it's essentially how information is sort of viewed once overlapping with other information. Um, then we have opacity, which we can either adjust with our slider or we can click and drag over the actual word. We can type it in um, and we can also use our numpad or number keys. So each number corresponds to a value of 10. So if I hit one, it's 10%, two, 20% opacity. If you take a look here, you'll see it's changing. Zero is 100. And if I type in the values uh, quickly after each other, I can type in the exact value that I need. 
the right, and I can do the exact same thing with the eraser. Uh, we then have flow and smoothing options, which we want to take a look at. Uh, and then we've got a couple of options here that are viable if we have tablets. Okay, um, seeing as most of us don't, I don't think it's necessary to sort of go through that, but just to give you an idea, our um, pressure for opacity option here, the harder you push, the more visible it'll be. Uh, we've got the uh, spray paint sort of tool, and then we've got the size, so the harder I push, the larger the stroke will be. All right, so just to give you an idea, going back to the concept of deep edging, okay, let's uh, do a very quick selection. So I'll just grab my so the quick selection tool, shortcuts W. Um, that didn't go as planned. Let's quickly rasterize this so I can make a selection. Um, why don't I try so hard to be a good human and make a tutorial? and then nothing wants to work. Okay, let's, uh, let's duplicate that, let's rasterize it, and we'll just focus on that. All right, so I make my selection, uh, do it very quickly, and what I can then do is I can apply my little mask. All right, so you'll see that because I had that selected, it's automatically kept it white and blacked out everything else. But what I can then do, working on the mask, is with my brush tool, go in, make sure I'm painting in with white. Let's bring that opacity back up to 100%. So if we paint all this in, I can then bring my opacity down to 50% and I can start removing that information. All right, so this is how I would go about deep edging a character or an object and placing it in a different space. It's important to remember that the information stacks. So the more I overwrite on an area, the sort of more I'm going to apply that opacity of uh, effect. So I tend to sort of just with a very soft brush go in with 100%, you'll see that if I hover quite far away from the actual artwork, that softness is still affecting it. And I can zoom in to the nth degree and continue uh, with my selections. So pretty used to seeing these pixels by now. At some point you'll have a uh, sort of very confusing dream about that. And this is hideous, so I'm just going to disable the layer. I can right click on it and disable it. I can right click and I can delete it. Okay, so that goes about that. And then today we took a look at vectors and strokes. Um, sorry, with the, the fills and strokes, uh, which I did cover, like I said, with our shape making sure that we've set that to a shape option. We can then adjust our fill and we can adjust our stroke as necessary. All right, so I think for now that covers everything we needed to inside of Photoshop. Uh, if you guys have any questions, drop me an email. You've got my address uh, or otherwise leave a comment here and I'll try and get back to you. Um, but yeah, I'll see you in the next one covering Illustrator. Ciao. Welcome back. So now we're going to be taking a look at Illustrator and I absolutely adore Cut, start again. Um, cool. Yo guys, okay, let's move on to the next piece of software. So Adobe Illustrator, my by far one of my favorite um, pieces of software. It really is fantastically powerful. Um, so also very similar to Photoshop in, an, in a sort of number of ways, but then there are a large amount of differences that sort of set Photoshop apart from Illustrator and InDesign, which are a lot more similar. All right, so we have got again our same home page. We've got some presets, we've got some tutorials we can take a look at, and we've got all of our old files. All right, so for the sake of brevity, I will just create a new file and we can set that to film and video and we can say create all right so cool you'll see that we dive in and we already have a uh, see-through background we can change that in our preferences but it is really quite helpful um, because we're working with vector files we can work uh, well you can in photoshop as well obviously creating psds but it's a good idea to know what is visible and what's not all right so Similar layout, let's make sure again we go to Window, Workspace, and we will be on Essentials. 
All right. Depending if you've accidentally moved things around, we can also then reset essentials. Okay, cool. There we go. So we are all looking at the same page and we can quickly go and select a line. We can grab our controls. All right, so I'm just going to window and turning these on. Uh, we've got our layers. Let's go to Pathfinder because I'm going to be introducing you to that at some point. And um, let's select type as well. All right, so we'll get to all of those. Okay, so let's take a look at our tools. All right, so we've got our selection tool, shortcut is V. Direct selection tool, shortcut is A. Very similar to how they work in Photoshop. Let me just draw a shape quickly. All right, so with my selection tool, I'm essentially working globally with my asset. All right, so I'll be doing my scaling and I'll be adjusting essentially the overall aspect. Okay, you'll also see that we have these little rounded circles and these allow us to round our paths without having to go with the pen tool and get it perfect. So I can either re-extend them out or bring them in. Um, and yeah, that's our selection tool. All right, A for the direct selection tool. And this allows me to work with my individual, individual points or vertices. Okay, so essentially, I think of the direct selection tool as working with individual aspects of whatever it is that you're working with and our selection tool then covers the entire piece. All right, so I can also hold down shift and select multiple pieces uh, or points and this will help me create some um, complex shapes. Complex, as I've said before, simply meaning that it's not your typical geometric shape. Okay. Um, Pen tool works very similar as well. Click and drag to create points. Make sure to select the very first point in order to close it. All right, thankfully in Illustrator, we don't have to tell um, the software whether or not we want it to be a shape. It works exactly as it says on the box. Shape tools, click and hold. We've got a bunch of options over here. All right, star tool. Um, how, let me adjust the, uh, I'll introduce the, the labeling mechanisms for our layers in a moment. Um, so one of the coolest differences as well, if we need to work with a sort of star tool or have a certain number of sides or faces, um, in Photoshop you need to go and specify that that's how many faces that you want. In Illustrator, if I click and drag, uh, I hope that you can see there, if I hit my up arrow key, down arrow key, I can increase and decrease the number of points that I have available to me. All right, we then have a brush tool, which we won't take a look at. We have our type tool, which we'll take a look at in a moment. Uh, rotate tool, eraser tool, shape builder, gradient, eyedropper. Uh, we'll take a look at all of these as we go. All right, so first of all, before I continue any further, let's take a look at how our layers work. Uh, okay, cool. Sorry for the interruption there. All right, so we're going to take a look at the layers quickly, and this is one of the biggest areas where software differs uh, between Photoshop and Illustrator and then InDesign as well. So Photoshop, we work on individ in a lot of individual layers for everything, all right? Whereas in Illustrator, we, if I sort of just quickly grab some shapes here and draw them out, we work on sub-layers. All right, so even though we've got our main layer here, this is essentially a collection of everything inside of it, okay? So the more shapes I draw, the more sublayers I'm gonna get. I can generate my own sublayers as well by clicking on this little create new sublayer button here at the bottom, all right? We do <laughs> need to be careful with that though. So I'm giggling because I remember completely screwing this up when I first started. You can open multiple sublayers inside of sublayers and this becomes an absolute nightmare to try and rectify. Um, so typically we'll just work on individual layers and we'll have a couple of sub-layers with whatever relates to that, okay? So this allows us to then group sort of assets as necessary. And for the sake of sort of like future work, if you're going into illustration or if you're going into film and design, work on multiple layers because if it does ever need to go on and be adjusted later down the line, Having everything in a single layer and no labeling whatsoever is not a good way to keep your clients happy. Okay, so we double click to relabel this. So I'll just call this example. And if I double click on the icon itself, I get a little 
sort of more options, I can relabel it still, and I can also change the color tag. All right, the color tag affects the outline uh, or the border of our shape. So you can see that as I change that color tag, um, it will change as well. Change this one here. Lovely. Not doing what I want, but anyway, that allows us then to make sure that we label everything as necessary. All right. So, for an example, if I was doing a character, uh, everything relating to the left arm would all be color coded the exact same way, and I knew exactly what I was looking at. Okay. Cool. So that is sort of an introduction to our layers. Now, taking a look at our tools. So I've got my shape tool selected, and very similar to Photoshop, I've got my control panel at the top with a lot of my options and I have my color options down here as well. All right, so let me draw out a shape quickly and we can adjust that as necessary. All right, so I can either click this little drop down here and get access to my sort of like color swatches um, or I can click on the color here itself, double click, and I get access to my color picker. All right, so the color picker, very, very useful tool, obviously, can apply all my different colors here. And you'll notice that as I drag this around, you'll see that my RGB, CMYK values are changing. All right, exactly the same way in Photoshop. We've got our hex code and we have our gamut warning. If I forgot to explain that, the gamut warning simply means that colors on screen will not be um, the same or as bright if we were to print them. All right, so obviously these very bright colors work great on screen, right? very luminous and incandescent, but it's not going to print. So by clicking on that color gamut warning, I can then jump towards, um, typically it will jump me towards the closest color that will then allow me to print. All right. Um, then I have these little options down here. All right, they're the same as this drop down here. I can turn off my fill. I can do the same for the stroke. Um, or I can apply a gradient simply by clicking on this little button over here in between my color and my turning off and that will open up my gradient options. All right, I'll do a small little exercise at the end. I'm quite a fan of the gradient vibes. Okay, then we have our stroke options. All right, so again, if I sort of just click on this little um, icon here, these outlines refer to my stroke and I can adjust my color as necessary and then I can adjust my stroke width. All right, so I can either click, if I hold down shift and click, it adjusts by values of 10. And I can obviously also just drop down and select predetermined values. All right. So as with most cases in the Adobe software, if it is underlined, it is a button. So I can actually click on the word stroke and I get a majority of my options here. All right, so the cap refers to whether or not the point is going to, um, or the line rather, is going to extend beyond um, the sort of the, the end point of my path. All right, I can also round them out. So this is obviously working on a straight line. Uh, I can round those caps out and I can uh, project that cap as well. Okay, in terms of corners, I can have sharp corners. I can round them and I can bevel them nice and simple and I can also align my stroke to either be equidistant around that path, appear inside the path or appear outside of the path. All right, so that's what we've got for our strokes there. We can obviously then also play with our opacity so we can slide up and down, we can type in whatever we want and we can click on the word opacity as well. All right, and this allows us to play with our blend modes. And again, I'll show you this at the end in the small exercise. Very, very powerful tools to get um, sort of used to, and they will definitely be very, very valuable tools to know. Okay, um, type tool works the same as it does in Photoshop. I can either click and it will start generating text, or I can click and drag, generate that text for me. And when I do that, you'll see that it brings up a couple of options here in my control panel for us already. Okay, going to window and making sure that I have my properties available. I can then have my character properties here as well. All right, so just to address some of the jargon or the sort of like design lingo, um, we have got both a typeface and a font. 
All right, so for those of us who don't know the difference, um, a typeface is the family of the font. All right, so I just want to quickly create a white background here for us. Um, so by that I mean, for example, the term Arial. Right, so we know that Arial comes with a, uh, a large number of fonts like Arial Bold, Italic, etc. Okay, so the typeface is the family of fonts. This is Myriad Pro, and my font is what I see. Okay, so that's what my viewer views. Okay, um, so I can then also make some adjustments here. So I can adjust the size of my text. Again, holding down Shift and clicking will increase it by a value of 10, and I can also then click as necessary. I then have access to this little option over here, these two capital A's with two arrows, and this refers to the amount of space between my sentences. All right, so this is part of our leading. Uh, for those of you, or us rather, who don't know, leading refers to the amount of space between each word as well as the space between our sentences. All right, um, sort of the term coming back from the print press where we use slivers of lead to separate our characters. Okay, then the next important piece uh, for our leading is this option over here. All right, this VA. Click my little drop down here and you'll see that this increases and decreases the amount of size between my characters. And this is very important because in typography, we need to make sure that it looks correct, that it reads correct, not really worry about the sort of mathematics in between. So if we take a look at this Ipsum, for example, right, the space between my P and S looks a lot smaller than it does between my S and U. Yeah, so that's where then we would select one of our characters and we could then increase the amount of space in between those characters. Right, so letting refers to affecting everything, kerning refers to affecting spaces between individual letters. Okay, we also then have our paragraph options, left align, right align, center, as well as our justification options over here. Okay, so that is that for type. Then, moving on, we've got our rotation tool, which we use to rotate our objects, and we then have the shape builder tool, which again, very, very useful tool to know. So, let's say I have drawn a couple of shapes like so, and I don't want to have to grab the pen tool and sort of trace out a complex shape. Uh, let's do something like that. Just change our color quickly. Um, all right, so there's a couple of ways I could go about interacting with these. The first is the Shape Builder tool, shortcut is Shift M. All right, and you'll see that when, let me make sure that I'm working on the correct pieces of information here. When I have my layers or my assets selected, my Shape Builder tool, when I hover over, you'll see I get these little indicators, all right? So this allows me to click and draw and to create dedicated spaces or to create a dedicated shape. All right, so this allows me to create a complex shape. Complex simply meaning it's not a generic um, geometric shape. And I can then interact with them as I see fit. All right, another method that I can use, which is um, also a very useful tool to know about, is the Pathfinder tool. All right, so let's do that quickly. So the Pathfinder tool can be found under Window and Pathfinder. And what this allows me to do is determine how these assets interact if I want to essentially use them as cookie cutters. All right, so if I wanted to add or create a single shape from this, rather than using the shape tool, I can always click on this little Unite option. All right, so we create a solid shape. We can also subtract the front shapes. Very, very useful. We can intersect, so wherever our information is overlapping, that will be shown, or we can dissect. Where, wherever it's overlapping, we can remove. All right, so very useful tool when it comes to creating complex shapes rather than having to go and pen out everything involved. Okay. The gradient tool I'll introduce in a moment, and our width tool as well. Okay, so let me grab my pen tool quickly, and we can then just, by clicking and dragging, I can draw out a different path. If I simply click, it'll create a straight line, and I have to close my path by clicking on my original point. Okay, so let me quickly grab my rectangle tool, and by grabbing my direct selection tool, 
I'll just grab this corner and round it out here and we can uh, maybe just round this one out as well like so all right cool so my gradient tool I can select my little gradient option by clicking over here alternatively my drop down here will have the gradient option and that opens up my gradient panel right now in my opinion gradient panel in, in Illustrator is a lot more user friendly it's also a lot more powerful uh, but that's obviously also depending on who you speak to okay so I can choose whether it's a sort of linear gradient a radial gradient or a complex gradient which is a very useful tool that's been added to Illustrator um, I'll cover that in future tutorials but for now we'll stick with this all right we can see the kind of fall off that we have um, I can see that it is being applied to my fill and not my stroke and if I want to reverse my gradients so that my black and white swap around I can hit this little button over here all right with my gradient tool selected I can actually redraw this shape as necessary and you'll see that I have these two large markers all right so these markers allow me then to adjust where the starting point for whatever colors I choose lie and then I have my center point, which determines uh, the range between those two points. You can see it here as well. All right. Another useful tool is that if I select one of my points, I have the opportunity to adjust its opacity. So I can create a proper fall off zone. Um, I can work with different uh, opacities to uh, sort of create different effects, uh, which becomes quite useful when we start applying textures. Um, and overall, just a very useful tool to be able to implement. All right, so let's give you an idea, holding down optional alt so that I can duplicate this the same way that it is in Photoshop. Let's just make this a solid color and uh, let's just stick with my favorite, cyan. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so I am now chilling in a gray workspace. All right, so we had our different color modes. So as long as I go to my um, not my screen mode Yo, it has been a while oh <laughs> Sorry, I'm getting completely lost there. All right, so you'll see that it is now gray even though I set a color and that's because Illustrator has now decided that this is going to be uh, set in grayscale. All right, so in my color here, you'll see I can adjust my keys, my values, but I can click this little drop down and I can turn off grayscale and turn it back to RGB. All right, so if you ever get to the point where this is only stuck in gray and you can't figure out why, just make sure that we're in our color panel and we can reset that to RGB and then we can adjust our color again and it should stick. Cool. All right, so a lot of the time, just personally, if I'm doing any sort of design, I'll work on super flat colors. Um, I can apply a stroke to this as well, just so I can introduce some methods of adjusting that. All right, so typically once I've worked with my basic colors, and uh, I've got everything that I want. I'll start duplicating everything and I'll play around with the gradient for uh, that sort of particular piece. All right, so if I was going to just adjust my opacity here, so let's bring this back up a little bit there and let's make it a little bit darker as well. Um, I can do this, something like that. Okay, so I can now also introduce the concept of blend modes to you. So with this, if I go up to Effect, I can come down to the Photoshop effects and go to Grain. This is one of my favorite sort of things to mess around with. And you'll see that the grain being applied is being affected by the gradient. Right? So you'll see it's a lot starker down here in the dark areas. I can adjust my contrast. Uh, so if I push that into the extremes, you'll see that I lose information as I go towards the sort of lighter side and I can say okay. All right, so now it looks absolutely hideous, which is fine, because what we then do is we click on opacity and we can play around not only with the opacity of the layer, but with the blend modes. All right, so blend modes are essentially how 
our software interprets color information that's overlapping. All right, so this is a great way to generate some fairly interesting content without having to go and sort of mess around with brushes and painting things in. It's a very lazy method, I know, but such is life. Um, then, just to also introduce our outlines, we, when we have our strokes selected, we um, have this little uniform drop-down over here. Right, so uniform currently means that the outline is exactly the same throughout and I then have some pre-made options here that will reinterpret that information for me. All right. However, as I'm sure you can see, only some of them really work well off the bat. So we also have a fantastic tool called the Width tool, Shift W for that, and this allows us to interact with our lines or our outlines rather directly. So you'll see where our points are automatically have our little vertices here. But if I click and drag, I can actually then adjust and I can readjust. I can s sort of drag this up and down in between points. Um, I can sort of shift them closer or further apart. So you really do have a lot of control to really create those nice slick. Um, they sort of always remind me of graphic novel kind of uh, kind of outlines or manga outlines, right? So you get like a nice amount of control over here. Um, and yeah, that is essentially that when it comes to the tools, right? Um, it does sometimes happen as well, just to show you, when we're working with assets inside of Illustrator, if we have a lot on screen, rather than going and hiding assets, we can actually double click on them. Right, and you'll see that we are currently now in isolation mode. So we're only working with this piece. Everything else is in place. It's just slightly less visible and we won't be interacting with it. Okay. So if I want to exit isolation mode, I just need to double click anywhere else and you'll see that our layers go back to normal. Okay. Um, that's pretty much that for Illustrator. We do have uh, the option to create clipping masks. So if I were to just draw a shape over here, select them both, whatever's on top is going to affect what's beneath. So I can right click and I can say create clipping mask and it's going to show what's inside of that selection. All right. So if I move that around, it moves the entire piece. If I grab my direct selection tool, I can then actually edit what falls inside of that mask. All right, and then obviously still have the, the options of rounding all that out. So this is kind of what we would do if we wanted to do a double exposure. Uh, maybe something I'll put together for you guys later down the line, just as a small exercise. Um, but yeah, apart from then applying masks, we could obviously use our Pathfinder tool and the Shape Builder tool to work out any kinks for that. All right, and that should be pretty much that for Illustrator. Um, apart from grouping. Okay, so grouping in Illustrator and InDesign works differently from Photoshop in the sense that um, normally, if we take a look here, when we group in Photoshop, this is kind of what it looks like, right? It's one large folder with everything inside. However, inside of Illustrator, as well as InDesign, grouping allows me to start treating separate assets um, as similar things. All right, so if I were to, let's say I had two of these, Okay, right click, transform, reflect, and I can then swap it around. Boom. So now I've got some like Cheshire sort of cat eyes. Okay, if I wanted to make sure that they were perfectly aligned, let's say I had them over here, right? If I go to my align options and I tell them to be center aligned, you'll see that they now sit directly on top of each other, which actually looks pretty dope, but in most cases it doesn't. All right, so what I can do is with my selection now made, I can right click and I can select group. Shortcut is control or command G. And now that group will be set as such, right? So this, these two images are essentially inside of one bounding box and anything that I apply globally will affect both of them. All right, I can always ungroup by command shift G or I can right click and I can say ungroup. All right, so it's a great way, even if you don't want the groups to necessarily stay grouped, it's a great way to help you align everything on screen and then you can ungroup and carry on moving from there. All right, um, and that's pretty much that. Again, any questions, feel free to get in touch. I apologize for the lack of energy. It's been a, it's been a, it's been a week, um, but yeah, hopefully this will have been a little bit more helpful.
All right. Um, and then, yeah, if you guys want to see more sort of breakdowns or any work methods, let me know. Um, if you'd be keen to sort of generate an artwork or something using this method, um, feel free. I can put a tutorial together that you guys could follow. But then again, I'm not too sure how many of you guys would actually want to do any extra work. So that's also fine. Okay, but we'll call it there. Have a great time further. And um, yeah, hopefully this was useful. Ciao. Everyone, Jason back again with the InDesign tutorial for you guys. All right, so again, exactly the same as pretty much any other Adobe software. We start off with our home page. We've got a couple of sort of presets that we can dive straight into, some tutorials we could take a look at. And we have got all of our previously sort of worked on files that we could dive straight back into. All right, going, going over to sort of create new. We'll see we've got print, web, and mobile uh, settings here. So I'm just gonna grab print, we'll stick with A4. Uh, you'll see that we can relabel it here. Uh, so I'll just call this tutorial for now. Um, we have different measurements of, or units of measurement rather. So when we're printing, we work with millimeters um, and we then have our pixels if we're working for uh, for online display or screen display, uh, which we then refer to as PPI, pixels per inch, and then we have DPI, dots per inch, when we talk about printing. Okay, we can adjust our orientation and we can adjust the number of pages that we need. So if I need to work on a 13 page spread, I can sort of just hit that. And if I need my pages to be facing, as if I were reading a magazine, I can turn that. If not, if I need them to be sort of just one underneath each other, export a large PDF file like that, um, I can then turn that off. All right, then we've got our sort of columns and gutters and bleeds and all that. Uh, and we can create our file and dive straight in. Okay, so very similar to Illustrator, we start off with our blank page and if we take a look at our layers, let's just jump over to Window, Workspace and let's dive into Essentials. All right, so our layers work the exact same way as they do in Illustrator. We work with sub layers. So anything that I create inside of a sub layer uh, will then I can then sort of like dive straight into that, collapse them as necessary. All right. Um, just taking a look at our basic tools, uh, let me sort of just drop a shape here now for us. So we have something to work with. Let's say fine to that. Uh, make sure to have my shape selected. There we go. All right. So I have my move tool or my selection tool. Okay, very similar to Illustrator. This is my global sort of adjustment tool for anything that I create. And then my direct selection tool I can use to move or interact with very specific points. All right, so either our vertices or our points, whichever one you sort of want to call. And uh, can delete that as necessary as well. Okay, we then have our page tool, uh, which we won't necessarily need to take a look at. We have our type tool works the exact same way as it does in um, Illustrator. So we've got our character options over here. So again, just a quick rundown, we've got our typeface and we've got our font, typeface being the family, font being what we see. Okay, we then have the size of our font. So if I were to sort of just type in here example, um, I can then adjust the size by either clicking, using my little drop down, or holding shift. I can increase or decrease these points by 10. All right. We then have some options again, just to show you. Uh, we have the options to determine the leading between our sentences. Okay. Um, so if we set that to auto, we'll be fine there. And we have our kerning, where we can adjust the leading of everything at once, um, or where I can interact with, let's say, my M over here. I can interact with my kerning to increase or decrease the space between my letters. All right, so remember with typography, it's all about being visually correct. Um, okay, so that's pretty much that for the type tool as far as we need. We do have the paragraph window as well. So if I go to window um, and I bring up my properties, you'll see that I have my paragraph option and I can use this again, center, left, justify, etc. All right, cool. We have our pen tool and our line tool. Line tool, 
is literally as it says on the box. Uh, so if we're working with our stroke and the properties, you see that I can make that larger. Um, if I click on stroke, I can determine whether I want my caps to be butt caps, round caps, or extended caps. Um, and I can adjust the joints. I can also then adjust, this will be easier to see with a, with a shape. Bum, bum, bum. Uh, if I give that a stroke, and let's set the color as this may be. All right, so I can increase that size, and then again, I can choose whether that stroke falls only inside of my path, equidistant on either side or on the outside of that path. Okay, great stuff. Color picking works very similar as it does in Illustrator, right? I can double click to grab my values. And seeing as we are now working in RGB space, this is sort of the realm of our color picker. All right, so we determine sort of the shade that we're going through and we'll drag it around. We do have access to our um, hex codes and I can also add a CMYK swatch if necessary. Okay, so we've got that there. Um, then, okay, so we've got our pen tool. All right, thankfully in uh, InDesign, we don't have to specify whether or not this is going to be a shape or a path. Uh, we can simply click and drag to create our vertices, all right? Or we can simply click to create straight lines and we have to again click on our first point in order to close that, all right? If I click and hold, we've got our add anchor point and delete anchor point tools and we also have our convert vertex tool, which allows me to then interact with these handles as necessary, okay? All right, moving down, we then have our rectangle frame tool. Now, the rectangle frame tool is fantastic because it allows us to place images directly in a point. So that would be command D, otherwise file place image. And if I were to just dive in here and say open this file, um, it's automatically gonna place it in that scene for me. All right, just grabbing my selection tool. So this can be slightly confusing to work with because now we are working with the border of our image and we're also working with the image itself. All right, so you'll see that when I select this and move it around, it moves where I tell it to and it has this blue border. But when I extend it, it's revealing more or less of the image behind it. All right, if I double click, you'll see I get a brown border and this is now me interacting with the image in the background. All right, so it can be a little bit confusing to get used to, uh, but once you get it down, it makes quite a bit of sense, actually. All right, so it just gives you that sort of freedom there. Okay. Then our shape tool, as I've said, so if we click and hold, we've got the ellipse and uh, polygon tools. Uh, we've got our gradient tool as necessary. We can obviously move around holding down spacebar, sliding back and forth, or we can grab our hand tool and Z to zoom, I can click in, holding down Option or Alt, click out to zoom out. All right, so now the sort of biggest difference and the best thing about InDesign is this software is geared towards generating content for print, essentially, or for content online, but the content is sort of sequential content. So we're either using it to create a poster or we're using it to create a magazine spread, um, and that is where our sort of layout changes the most with InDesign. Not only do we have layers, we also have our pages, all right? And uh, just from personal experience, this is what we would go about using if we had to put a project brief together for a client or uh, the briefs that you guys get. Um, typically, we'll make those in InDesign and the page system makes life quite simple, all right? So I can select multiple pages and I can straight up just delete them. I can add pages as necessary and I can actually duplicate pages as well so that I can then adjust where they lie simply by clicking and dragging to determine what side uh, of the spread they're going to fall. All right, and then uh, zooming out, you'll see that I now have all my pages here. So I'll have my title. This is the inside of that page, facing page. This is the back of that page, all right? Um, so the pages are there for us to, to work on large amounts of information, which is very useful. Um, all right, so 
that is pretty much that. As I said, the color is, is pretty much exactly the same. And what's great about this is these tutorials become shorter and shorter because of how similar the software is. Um, I can still duplicate my ob objects by holding down Option or Alt. You can see I can click and drag and I can place that in space. Um, if I drag it out of these artboard areas or these pasteboards, it kind of disappears. But these spaces are here. If I leave objects here when I export my file as a PDF, they're not going to be visible. They're kind of just here as a planning space for me to work with, all right, which is also quite useful. Then taking a look at our layers, we've taken a look at that. If I want to align my objects, again, I just need to make sure that window, um, I make sure that my properties panel is open and I've got my align options. So I can align my image now within that frame that I made for it. And I can align the frame itself as well. All right, so I can sort of work to get my perfect layout there. Um, grouping, isolation mode, that's pretty much that. <laughs> um, all right, so I may have forgotten to cover a few things. If you guys have any questions, please feel free to drop me a message, either email or comment on this. Um, and yeah, again, any confusion, let me know. Otherwise, hopefully this has helped a little bit. Apologies again for the lack of energy and um, check you guys next week. Ciao.